we're going to start. All right, good afternoon. Well, good morning. Um, I'll be your, I guess, your host, your MC for today. Um, we're going to start. Well, first, I just want to say thank y'all for coming out to our Black History program. Um, I want to thank Ms. Davis and Mr. Worthy for planning this. And we're going to start with our welcome from Cardi Ann Williams, and then we'll move on to our prayer with Samuel, um, Samuel Kelly. Good morning. Good morning. We would like to welcome everyone to our Black History Program for February. The theme for this program is flourishing against the odds. Look out among us. There are people who may shape the direction of the world yet to come. Our past is clouded with the bittersweet victories of those who gave their all. We are a testament to overcoming the odds. We pay tribute to our ancestors who stood strong against the ravage of the past. Our history is still being made. Whether it is his story or her story, we came over on a ship and the struggles continued during years of brutal oppression. But isn't it remarkable? We marvel at the miracles of how we got over. Join us as we celebrate the survival of the past experience and those who live all to succeed and flourish in, the, in spite of the obstacles they face. Our Father, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth and in the heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. 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 Before I start to sing, lift every voice and sing, I would like to give a background on the song because I think it's very important to know, especially as African Americans, where some of our background comes from and why certain things are very significant in our culture. Many people are surprised to learn that the Lift Every Voice and Sing was first written as a poem. Created by James Weldon Johnson, it was performed for the first time by 500 school children in celebration of President Lincoln's birthday on February the 12th, 1900, in Jacksonville, Florida. The poem was set to music by Johnson's brother, John Roseman Johnson, and also adopted by the National Association of Advancement of Colored People, known as the NAACP, as its official song. Today, Lift Every Voice and Sing is one of the most cherished songs of the African American Civil Rights Movement and it's often referred as the Black National Anthem. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven rings Ring with the harmony of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening sky, let it resound loud as a rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. We are happy to have with us today a pillar of our community, 
He grew up in the Woodsburg community and is a graduate of Finley High School. He worked for many years as the Human Resource Director of Millican Mills. He is the former mayor of Lockhart, where he resides today with his wife, Alma. He is the brother of our very own, Mr. W.E. Worthy. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Leroy Worthy, who has come to share his story of flourishing against the odds. May we please stand here. Technology has come a long way since I was arrived. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the class. I'm so proud to be here. I look out over the class here. So many young faces take me back a long ways. Back a long ways. I graduated from high school in 1962. And I still have my reign. 1962. I cherish this reign. because I was able to graduate. And I wanted to do that, to be a productive citizen. <coughs> I wanted to be educated, so I still cherish my reign, 1962. I don't know how much it's worth today, but it, I let you know that I'm proud of it. And I want you all, when you grow up and graduate, to be proud of being able to graduate and walk out into the world, to see the world. Can y'all hear me at the back? Okay. My story goes back, I'm the grandson of a sharecropper. Who knows what a sharecropper is? Kids. You know what a sharecropper is? Okay. How many more know what a sharecropper is? Good, good. I know your history then. A sharecropper is that someone, a landowner owns some land, and he wants to make a profit off his land, he or she. So they have a, a choice of either cotton, cattle, or hog. And they want somebody to move in on the land to help them make a profit. So a sharecropper moves in in a house that's owned by the landowner, and they decide to, to raise cotton. As they raise cotton, the landowner gets half of what's raised. And we, go, we went by bales of cotton back then. If you had eight acres of, of cotton, you wanted to pursue eight bales of cotton. So the landowner would have four bales, and you would have four. The landowner would put up the, the material, and back then we had mules to till to the ground. We didn't have no tractors back then. We had mules to plow the ground. So you can imagine eight acres of cotton and a mule tilted that ground to get it ready to plant cotton. So you had to do that. You started in March, getting your soil ready to be planted by April. Your whole focus was on trying to preserve that, that ground so you could have eight bales of cotton with eight acres. So the product was cotton seeds. And you plant the cotton seeds in the fur when you dig it out, and each one of those stalks would come up with, with lots of cotton on it. And one boa, we call it, would have five locks in it. You had to preserve those five locks in order to get your bale of cotton from an acre. So it was a process of working to preserve those five locks of cotton to keep what we call the boa weevil from getting to it. A boat weaver would get to it, eat up your lot. You can imagine they eat up another lot. It'd be hard to have your five acres, I mean your bale of cotton out of an acre. So you had to have a process to preserve those five lots. Okay, can anybody know what that is? What was that? Preserve those, to save those five lots. That was 
one of the initiatives that my grandfather taught me. If you're going to do something, you do it right. And you preserve what's there for you. Don't let the insects take it away from you. So we had to, to mix a chemical together to spray the cotton to keep the bugs from getting to it. And that was a process. That was responsibility. It was your responsibility to three times or four times a year to spray that cotton so you could have those five locks preserved to get those eight bales of cotton. Because you wanted to have as much as you can because you were working the saw. Y'all still with me? So you take care of what you've got and what you're trying to preserve. That is called responsibility. Take care of what you got. <coughs> and as you grow in life and you come across things, you take care. You be proud of what you got. When it comes harvesting time, we had to pick the cotton. You go out there and pick the locks. You get it all together. And then you put it in a sack. And you wanted to have a 500-pound bale. That's what you call a bale of cotton, 500 pounds. You got a 500 bale of cotton, you carry it to the gin, and they pay you 36 cents a pound for your cotton. Okay, you still with me? Okay. We still, we still hadn't got any money yet. <laughs> hadn't got any money. We got to harvest the whole crop. So at the end of the crop, we got eight, acres of, eight bales of cotton. The landowner gets four bales. My granddaddy got four bales. So we lived off that, the money from those four bells till the next year we had a crop. So we, we gathered in October, so it had to take us to the next year October. So what, what did we do then during the year? How did we survive? <coughs> Remember, there wasn't no grocery stores like it is today. There wasn't no grocery stores like it is today. You couldn't go get no pops. You couldn't get no loaf bread. You couldn't go get none of that stuff. That was not available at that time. So what we did? What do you think we done? Huh? We grew it. That's right. My grandfather, only thing he bought from a stove was sugar, coffee, flour, and other stuff that uh, cosmetic stuff. We raised our, we we we, we, had, we raised hogs. We raised cows. We had a garden. We had, we had a garden. So we raised everything we ate. We raised it. And all the neighbors. So we couldn't go to the grocery store. There wasn't no grocery store. You couldn't buy it no way because you didn't have no money. <laughs> so you had to raise everything. So we had goats. <coughs> we had everything like that. <coughs> Anybody ever drink any, any, any goat milk? Yeah. You know what buttermilk is? Yeah. Sweet milk? We had all that on the farm. All of that was available to us on the farm. So that was learning you how to take care of yourself. Today, if that happened today, we wouldn't be able to do that because we don't know how to raise a garden. Mr. Worthy don't know how to raise a garden. <laughs> so we don't know how to raise a garden today. Okay. So that's any, any question on the sharecropper before I move on. Any question on the sharecropper? It is. It, it was hard work. We didn't have we, we, we didn't have running water. We had a well, had a spring to go to spring to get water. We didn't have none of that stuff back then. You worked hard, and being a sharecropper's grandson, we had we had we had to work real hard. We get up in the morning, eight o'clock. You come home for lunch, and twelve to one. Take a nap, go back, and you stay till the sun go down. That's where you were all that time. There. Okay? We got the share crops on them. Okay, my parents, that time, they taught me, they talked a lot about love, respect, responsibility, being trustworthy, being truthful. My grandmother talked about being patient. So you ask the Lord for something, you're not going to come right away. But be patient. Talked about patience. They talked about education. They wanted us to have an education. And these are people, these are older people born in eight, 1887, but they believed in <coughs> education. I can remember when my grandmother first registered to vote. That thrilled her to death. 
to get the vote, ready to vote. So they, they taught us about love. And love, you can't hardly make it in the world if you don't love your neighbors. It's hard to survive if you don't love. Okay? My early education, which was very difficult, being a sharecropper on a farm, trying to go to school and be educated and work a farm. So uh, we, we went to school in a, a building, a two-room building. And back then, before 1936, 19, 19, 1936, education for minorities was for the sixth grade. It wasn't the eighth and ninth grade because it wasn't available at that time. So we had this one room shack building. But you know what? We had to go in the morning and start a fire in that building. Go out and get some wood, make a fire in the building so it could be warm. Wasn't no heat there. Go down in the bushes, get some wood, make a fire in this two room building. All right, what we did for lunch, we bought lunch from home. Had to bring your lunch from home, and you bought your lunch from home, and then at some time we started a cafeteria, and the farmers would bring supply beans and corn and stuff to the school so we could have food. Somebody would cook it for us at the school. We had two lovely teachers, and one name is Mary Pendergrass and Miss Irene Lamb. And they taught my mother and Pam, but they were very dedicated to teaching. It's a whole lot different today. You had to stand up and read before the teacher so they know that you knew your paragraph. You just couldn't sit there and look. You had to stand up and your paragraph there, you had to get in front of the teacher and read your paragraph in front of the teacher. Writing was the same way. You wrote a paragraph, you went before the teacher and let them look at your paragraph. It's, they took time with each one of us to make sure that we could write a paragraph and we could read. They took the time with the two, two, two ladies there. And uh, let me break off a story here, tell you a true story. We carried lunch to school. We had a place to put your lunch in. My mother did day work at that time. So she came home, she bring us, she worked on the weekend, come home on the weekend. So we had to put out a lunch up in a little old cabinet. Somebody kept stealing my lunch. Because I had good lunch. We had, we had ham biscuits. We had good lunch because we were raised on the farm. So we had good lunch. So somebody kept stealing my lunch. I go to the teacher. I tell Miss Mary, somebody got my lunch. She said, you didn't bring no lunch, boy. I said, yeah, I did bring some lunch. She said, no, you didn't bring no lunch. I said, man, I'm stealing my lunch. So my mother came home. This is gross. Came home and had some X-lax made like candy. You know, a little chocolate blossom, of eggs like made like candy. So I'm being an engineer, thinking all the time, how I'm going to catch a person stealing my lunch. Okay? It's on my mind. So I'm going to catch them stealing my lunch. So when I picked my lunch that day, I put about four boxes of that little chocolate candy in there. Thought it was candy, okay? So about 12.30, we went to eat. My lunch was gone. I said, oh, I can find out who got it. I said, I'll find out the fella got my lunch this time. So we got back in class, and the, and the guy said, may I be excused? I said, oh. <laughs> so, so he came back again. He said, may I be excused? The teacher said, you done been out here one time. <laughs> so so be, me being a little bishop boy, so when he came back next time, I popped him. Boom! The teacher said, what you do that for? She said, I said, that's who been getting my lunch. She said, how do you know? I said, you see him going back for the bathroom, don't you? She said, yeah, they ain't got to do with your lunch. I said, I put some X-Lax in my lunch today. <laughs> so, so the teacher had told us, I told y'all about stealing. You don't steal stuff. You get caught like he did. So don't you bother. Nothing nobody else got here, so you have to pay the price he paid. A true story, but it tells you that, you know, if you do something wrong, and you, you will get caught. So it's best not to do it, okay? It's best not to even do it. Just like telling a lie. It's best not to tell no lie. Because you forget what you said the first time. Then you got to come up and try to do something else. 
So be honest. They, they, my grandma, they called me to be honest, okay? All right, after going through grammar school, we moved into high school. And the high school was Finley High School, named after Samuel F. Finley. He was the owner, and he was the principal. Prior to that, they tried to have a, a, a high school for minorities, East Chester High. They didn't want to call it Chester High because they had Chester High. But somewhere down the line, they named the school after Mr. Finley. Finley High, and they named one in Union after Mr. Sim. So at that time, when teachers would come around, and principal, they would try to name the school after the, the principal. We had Sims High and we had Finley High. Y'all heard of Finley High? You heard of Mr. Finley? You hadn't heard of it? Okay, Finley High. Well, Finley High is in East Chester. The old building is still there. So when I started the school there, we had to ride the school bus then. Prior to that, we walked to school. We didn't have a school bus, we had to walk to school in the rain and all that. But Finley High, I rode to school on school bus. I come acquainted with a with the principal named Mr. Richardson. Mr. Richardson was a he was single. <coughs> he was very dominant. And he wanted you to learn to have an education. But aunt would cook for him on occasion. Because he, he lived by himself. My aunt would cook for him. That's how I got to know him, Mr. Richardson. Because I would spend time with my aunt, and he would come by and he'd get his get his lunch, get his dinner. And we got to be real close, and I, when I was in high school, you got to have, you got to have your goal. You got your goal. Have y'all got your goal set? Yeah. You need a backup goal, okay? When I was in high school, we had something we called vocation or education, and I took brick mason. At that time, I didn't think I was going to be able. I didn't know I was going to be able to go to college, so I took brick mason. At that time, our schools. We'd all meet with the other black schools for one seminar or one gathering to see who had the best brick masons, who had the best cottons, who had the best homemade, who had the best there. We all met. So I took brick mason because my uncle was a contractor. And so our school, we had the contest, and our school come in second place in the state. It was three guys of us laying bricks, the Stetson boys and me, we laid bricks. And our school come in second place. And it was a company named Daniel's Construction Company. Y'all ever heard of Daniel's Construction Company? And back then, it was construction work, teaching, preaching, and barbering, and doing hair. That was about the only tech job we had then. But we come in second place in the state. Our school did. We missed out by not cleaning the bottom brick when we laid brick. You had to clean all your brick. You lay, you lay your brick and you clean it. We missed out, so we, didn't, we got second place. All right? At that time, the contractor was there watching to see who had the best brick mason. They said, offer you a job. So they did. They offered us a job. And boy, our head got big, then showed up. You go in to work for a brick mason company, offering you a job. So you get a big head then. So I didn't take the job, but I told the man, I said, I want to leave South Carolina. I want to get out of Dodge because I was tired of working on the farm. So I headed north. Didn't take the job as a brick mason, but I had to trade. It was something I could fall back on. I felt like I'd do something else. Then if I had to go back to brick mason, I could. So that was my, that's what I'm telling you. You need to have two goals. One, what you want to do, and something to fall back on because it comes, it'll come in. And left home, traveling north, $35 in my pocket, going on, seeking work. Still had this good personality, respect. And when I arrived in Philadelphia, when I arrived in Philadelphia, I got off the train. And a lady was in front of me with two luggage. And I helped her with her luggage. I didn't know somebody was watching us getting off the train to try to identify who they wanted to hire. So when I got off the train, I helped the lady with her luggage. I carried her to the, to the taxi. The guy come over and asked me, he said, you looking for work? I said, yes, sir. He said, I got a job. I said, I don't know you. He said, you ain't gonna know who you go to work for. He said, but I want to offer you a job. I said, why? He said, I see the respect you have for that lady. You never know who's watching. Mm -hmm. See, I had the respect for that lady, helped her with her luggage, and I got a job. 
for that respect. Okay? Then I was, uh, after I came back home, Mr. Richardson, they was, uh, they had passed a affirmative action. Do y'all know what affirmative action is? That's equal justice and equal pay, okay? For jobs. And they had passed a affirmative action bill and Lockhart Mill had took a contract with Fold Voter Company. And they had to have an affirmative action program. They had to have minorities working with the material inside the, the plant. Prior to then, they had minorities working in the shop and in the warehouses. None was inside the plant working with material. So they sent out a memo, a letter to three high schools, Sims High School, Finley High School, and Jefferson High School. So they sent three candidates for employment. We got three jobs open. Sent three candidates. So, so there was nine of us interviewing for three jobs. But Mr. Richardson talked to us before we went and told us how to present ourselves. He said, you be very respectful. You say, yes, sir, no, sir, and you pay attention. That's what he told us when we went over. So we went through the interview, and the three of us from Philly High got the job because we had that respect, and we showed their personality. The other guys were sitting back laying in the seat, wasn't paying and no eye contact, but Mr. Richardson told us how to prepare for the interview, and we did, and all three of us got the job. And that shows you that respect goes a long way. So after I got the, the job at, at, at Lockhart, as a sweeper, this is the key, as a sweeper. Make, a sweeper had to keep the place clean. I had a job prior to that making $2.50 an hour. I took this job for $1.15 an hour. My grandmother wanted to get me off the road. She was tired of me getting up in the morning on construction work going away from home. I said, I told her, I said, Mom, I ain't going to take this job, $1.15, and I'm making $2.50 an hour. She said, but baby, you might be in a position where you can help somebody. So this is a start. She said, I'm praying for you. I said, you're going to be blessed. So I took the job, $1.15 an hour. I went in the next day and told the man, I said, I ain't going to stay here for this man. I said, I'm making more money than this, letting people ride with me. He said, but he said, Leroy, I like your attitude. He said, you can go places with this company. I said, well, dollar fifteen cent hour ain't gonna take me for a night nine. <laughs> but, but he convinced me that I was the candidate that he wanted to bring into the operation to build on. But, you know, made me feel good. Didn't have that respect. And so I took the job as a sweeper. I worked my way up. Like he said, if I work, I worked my way up to a manager. Then I went my way into human resources, where I could really help people. When I got into human resources, I could really help people. So I started bringing minorities into the plant from different various construction work, out of the kitchens, cooking, and all that kind of stuff. So I gave them an opportunity to come to work into the plant. And it helped them grow. You know, life is a growing aspect, just like the roots of a tree. You grow every day. Every day you're growing. If you're not growing, standing still, you're going to die. So it's a growing process. So I worked my way up to human resource where I could hire people, had opportunities to dis find people, which I didn't like to do, but I helped people grow. And being in that position, I come acquainted with a lot of the governors of South Carolina. I met all the governors, Governor Dick Riley, Cal Campbell. We went on, we went on trips together. I had the opportunity to, to go to New York, the Waldo Building in New York. Motel, the biggest motel in the world. And I made three presentations in Washington. Two on the Senate floor and one on the House of Representatives. One on the Senate floor was about cotton dust. I mean, on the, on the House of Representatives, about cotton dust. And on the Senate floor was about NAFTA, the North American Trade Agreement. Trying to tell them what it's going to do to the textile plant if it passed. And it did pass, and we lost a lot of jobs when, it, when the NAFTA passed. Mr. Milliken and I became friends. He was the owner of the company. So he was sending me on different avenues to represent the company. I don't know was I a token or just a minority, but he was sending me out there to do that. So I met Strong Thurman, made a presentation for Strong Thurman, French Holland, and, and Cal Campbell, and Ken Holland. And it's, it's amazing to go in the White House and stand between them and make a presentation. Sharecropper from South Carolina, farm boy, 
standing in front of all those dictators making a presentation. But I had good training from my grandparents, and they told me to be patient. And I had good education from my teachers. Good teachers sat down and took the time to talk to me. And that meant a lot. And I was obedient, obedient. You know, you've got to be obedient. I'm working with the third grade now at Lockhart Elementary School. I got 23 students in the third grade. And what I'm teaching them to obey and be obedient and be proper. Sit in your seats correct. Don't lay back. Keep eye contact. All that's important. As I travel for the company, recruiting, I would go on college campus, hiring managers to come into the plant to move us forward. So every manager we want to hire is going to move the company forward. We didn't want to hire an individual just to come in and have a job. You got to hire individuals coming to your plant. And guess what? They had to have a 3.80 to, to, to go to work with my company. If you had a 2.5, I couldn't talk to you. 3.8 was the lowest I could talk to. And most of them were engineers. So, so I had to, we had to hire people to come in and run the company. So when I would go on college campus interviewing, like I'm going to interview these four guys here for a job in the plant, process engineer, each one of them would have to tell me why they would make me a good candidate. They got to convince me why they're the best candidate. That was part of my job. So when I took them back to work, if I wanted to hire, he had to be a success story for me. If he wasn't a success story for me, I didn't do my job of getting the right candidate. So I had to get the right candidates to be a success because I was held for turnover. All right, y'all got any questions? Wrapping it up now. I know I took y'all on a journey there. Any questions? We know what a share crop is. Okay, mentor is very good. I had two mentors when I was growing up. One named Mr. Cal Haynes, the late Cal Haynes, and Wilson Pendergrad. They saw the good in, in me, so they mentored me and wanted me to go forward. So we all need mentors. I'm trying to do that now in school. But we all need mentors, and we all have a part to play. I'll tell you if, you, if you, if you, if you just keep a positive attitude and keep educating yourself every day, the world is wide open. You can go anywhere you want to go. But you've got to educate yourself. You've got to conduct yourself in a proper manner of a way. That is very important. I looked at so many students as I was interviewing that I knew needed the job, wanted the job, but they just didn't have what we needed. And that's, that's sad. The companies today are looking for candidates. And as you, get, you go to college, so many college graduates today that don't have jobs. What do I? How they missed out? So many college graduates today, so many with doctor's degrees, don't have jobs. It's all about that interaction with that interview and that personal appearance. It's all about that. When you got 150 people you can select two candidates for, you're going to select the one that appears to you. I've talked to so many engineers with 4.0, because they just didn't have the personality that's going to fit into my workforce to help us grow. That's what it's all about, growing. They had a good, they had a good academic, 4.0, but they just didn't have the personality, the appearance, to look like a professional in a Fortune 500 company. So you got to look like a professional when you work in a Fortune 500 company. Any questions? That's it. I want to thank. Huh? How many more minutes I got? We got some people after this. Okay. I want to thank Ms. Ms. Davis and Mr. Woods for having me come in and share my story with y'all. I hope y'all got something out of it.
Um, next, we will have an original poem read by Chesty Mobley. strong. We have shown the culture we belong. Suffering has caused us a good amount of pain, giving us the power to gain love and peace towards each other, the ones who have hurt our sisters and brothers, feeling joy and love of inspiration that can bring peace to a nation. Not through hate and fights, do what your heart says is right. Do not let our past, do not let our past be a mystery. Show love for black history. Next, we will have a poem recitation by Cayman Williams. Good morning. Good morning. This poem is a tribute to those who open the doors. The name of this poem is Lay Down the Burden. Look out to see the man with the bent back. He toiled in the soil to put food on the table. He is our hero. Look down to see a woman on her knees scrubbing the floor. She spent long hours working in other people's houses. She is our hero. A man brave enough to stand in the face of adversity deserves our undenying gratitude. A woman strong enough to carry the hopes of her children deserves our unconditional love. We are the beneficiaries of countless men and women who stood apart and refused to give up in spite of adversity. Do not let their efforts go down in vain. We must pick up the torch and carry on the work they started. Our heroes are not dead and gone, but alive in each of us. Thank you. Okay, next we will have, okay, next we will have um, a presentation by Ms. Lewis and some of her students with Trust Your Struggle. As all of you know, I'm Miss Lewis. <coughs> I'm not here to give you a history lesson. I'm here to give you a lesson in life. <laughs> you know, I've always hated the word can't. I can't do this. I can't do that. Before you've even attempted the task, before you've even looked at the problem. I can't. I grew up in a household with mostly males. My father and all his sons and the one daughter that he wished had been a son. <laughs> the money went toward the boys to go to college and become professionals. I was to get married and have children. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. My mother's mother had always instilled in me the belief that I could become whatever I desired to be. In fact, 
I can recall a poem that I had to learn in fourth or fifth grade, and I'd like to recite it for you. I want it to sink. I want it to sink within you. Somebody said that it couldn't be done. But you know what? I, with a chuckle, reply <laughs> that maybe it couldn't. But I would be one who would not say so until I tried. So I buckled right in <laughs> with a trace of a grin on my face. If I ever worried, I hid. I started to sing as I tackled that thing. You said it couldn't be done? Well, guess what? I did it. Now, to reiterate or repeat, I said I was going to talk about a lesson in life, not a history lesson. There are so many great people who have come before us who are responsible for opening doors of opportunity for us. People who were really, who were ready to put their lives on the line. People who died. And you know, I, I, I look around today and I see so many students who take all of that for granted. You just don't realize how much your ancestors, and not only them, but their uh, Caucasian supporters as well, had to endure disdain or the anger from crowds who did not want them associated, you know, with any form of civil rights. You were in lovers. Okay? But you know what? I don't know about you, but I still struggle. You're probably struggling with something right now. But you have to believe in yourself. You know, the late Whitney Houston said it best in her song, The Greatest Love of All. The greatest love of all is learning to love yourself, to say that I know they're talking about me, or he doesn't like me. Why am I being treated this way? Why are all of these things happening to me, God? I'm a good person. If every day, upon awakening, the sky was blue, the weather was nice, the sun is shining. You know, we get used to that, and we wouldn't know what to do when it thundered, or when it rained, or when it snowed. We wouldn't know how to act. That is life. You're not gonna have sunshine and blue skies, sunny days all the time. You're gonna have some rough days. You're gonna have some rough days. I can't believe my best friend stabbed me in the back in Tupelo. I cannot believe professional people would do something like that. I cannot believe when they know what I've gone through and they still are willing to push the dagger in even more. You know, you have to come to realization that not everybody in the world is good people, but as you grow and you mingle with more people, you're gonna find that to be the case. 
Sometimes you feel like you're at the end of your rope. But you know what you have to do? You have to tie a knot in that rope and hold on. That's right. My father and my grandfather are preachers, just in case you want to know. <laughs> Bottom line, these struggles, these struggles, Lord, I've had them. But right now, I'm feeling good. And to be a serious citizen, I'm not looking too bad either. <laughs> I don't need anybody to tell me that because I look in the mirror every morning. <laughs> and I like what I see. <laughs> Bottom line, you've got to, you know, you, you struggle, but you let that struggle teach you something. Now today, I can honestly say, because of those rough times, because of dealing with friends who were duplicitous, who were not honest, who were two-faced, okay? I'm now, I'm going to go out there and face this senior world, and I am strong. I am a strong black woman. I am a wise black woman. I am a proud black woman. And you know, I know whatever I attempt in this life at the Chester High School, that I'm going to be successful. And the reason is because I trust my struggle. Trust yours. I struggle with this. I struggle with disloyal friends, and it caused me not to trust anyone. But I met one person that I could trust, and I knew she wouldn't let me down. And so now I'm wiser about who I choose. <laughs> Sometimes you think your teachers are unfair. You think your parents are unfair. Sometimes these little girlfriends and boyfriends. Oh my God, why you want to do me like that? Or oh, why you want to do me like that? <laughs> okay? Just remember that when God made one, he didn't stop. Okay? The, the, the biggest fish is still there to be caught. So just get you a new fishing pole and throw it in the lake and that thing you thought you loved becomes nothing. Okay? And the same as far as guys are concerned. Okay? You're going to have struggles. Your people might be unfair to you. Don't stop loving yourself. Don't stop believing in the Almighty. And most of all, don't stop believing in self. Trust your struggles. <laughs> we like to thank Ms. Lewis again for her empowering presentation about trust your struggle. I learned something. I don't know if y'all learned anything, but I did. And um, next we have the closing prayer. No, sorry. We'll have a, um, a selection by the Red Hill Baptist Church to inquire. Thank you. 
like to thank Red Hill Baptist Church Teen Choir for that beautiful selection. And next we will have a closing prayer by Samuel Kelly and then closing remarks by Justin Jackson. Bow your heads, please. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord God. Lord God, we thank you for this program, God. God, we thank you for everything that you've done in this program, God. Let us be able to use it in our daily walk with you, and let us be able to use it in our daily walk through life, God. Lord God, let us, let us let this program teach us a lesson, God, to understand your will and understand what it is that we have to accomplish in our daily life, Lord God. And let us be thankful, not be take advantage of the things that we have now, Lord God. And we'll forever give the glory and the praise in your son Jesus, and we pray. Amen. 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 We would like to thank Mrs. Davis and Mr. Worthy for having enough faith in us to present this program. We would like to thank all those who helped sponsor this event. We are honored that Mr. Leroy Worthy has given his free time to share memories, visions, and experiences with us. We are thankful. We would like to leave you with a simple suggestion. Go out and make the world a better place. When you see an elderly person in your community, give them the respect that they deserve. They survive. The broad salt on their dignity. Give them a hug, for they are dream builders who pay the way for younger generations by giving us the strength to carry on. Many of them survived and flourished against the sum of odds. They are to be celebrated and commemorated during the Black History Month. This concludes our program. Thank you.